history is, first of all, why were Adam and Eve kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Because they raised a little cane. I know it's not as good as the mushroom, but, you know, you've got to take what you get. Adam and Eve, as our first parents, had many children. We, we know that. I mean, it's obvious because, you know, Adam and or, uh, Cain and Abe, Cain was worried about all the other people that were going to kill him. They had to marry somebody so they could have kids. So, you know, they had to have a lot of children. But we know of three for that the Bible mentions specifically three sons that are named in the Bible. The third one, whom we're not really going to deal with today, his name was Seth, which means granted, probably because after Cain killed Abel, uh, Eve prayed for another son and was granted Seth. The first one was named Cain, whose name means acquired or possession. Eve thought that Cain really belonged to her, evidently. Um, and perhaps even that he was the Messiah that God promised. If we go back to chapter 3, the story of the first sin, the fall of mankind, so to speak, uh, we read that the Lord promised that Adam and Eve that one would come who would uh, crush Satan's head, though his own heel would be bitten. And so uh, Eve, you know, with each successive child, I'm sure wondered, is this the one? Is this the one? Cain had other ideas, of course. He didn't think he belonged to anybody. He was his own man, and no one would tell him what to do, and that became pretty obvious in today's story. He belonged only to himself. But Eve and Cain were both wrong on that account. We don't possess ourselves, actually, or anyone else, for that matter. God created us. As, we, uh, as I read earlier in the uh, 100th Psalm, we are his people. He created us. We belong to him. And Paul reminds us also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, Don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So we belong to God first and foremost. But Eve had another son. His name was Abel, which means breath or puff. And uh, he became a, uh, the embodiment, and I was going to say living embodiment, but he wasn't living for long enough. He became, uh, that became a of his life. In James 4, uh, the scripture says, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So that really described Abel. Um, Abel also means mourning, like weeping, that kind of mourning which is something also that was fulfilled when Abel was killed. And he was killed because he had something that Cain did not have. And that important something was faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 4, By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith he still speaks, even though he is dead. So Abel had faith, whereas Cain did not. And Hebrews eleven six reminds us that we must have faith, all of us, no matter whom we are. If we want to please God, we need to have faith. It's essential. Without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And as we read throughout the Bible, we also see uh, it's impossible not to please God with faith. We sometimes forget that. We know we have faith and we, we, know we trust in Jesus Christ, but then we sometimes despair over this, that, or the other thing. We get down in the mouth and discouraged about this, that, and the other and, and wonder... You know, is God against me, or why does all this happen to me? God is pleased with you. He loves you. If you have faith, you have pleased God already. You don't have to do something special to get God on your side. God, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can anyone do to me, the psalmist says. But Abel had faith, and Cain did not. Faith meant that Abel trusted in the God that he was sacrificing to. Faith moved Abel to sacrifice his very best to God. 
And that, I think, is the biggest difference between the two sacrifices. We read the story in Genesis 4, and we wonder, well, how come, you know, how do we know that, that uh, God accepted Abel's and not Cain's? Well, I'm not sure, you know, there's a little children's Bible story book I remember, and it was it had a picture of the two sacrifices, and Abel's, you know, the smoke of his sacrifice was going up, and Cain's looked like it was wet leaves or something. The smoke was going down. We don't know about all that, uh, how they knew. We do know that it was made evident to the two, God, to Cain and Abel, whether God accepted them or not. Then we wonder, what was the difference? But that, too, is really covered in the Scripture in verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Just some random stuff, and we don't know how much. Might have been just a sample. But Abel, verse 4, brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And some people say it's that animal sacrifice. God's pleased with blood. Shed blood is uh, what symbolizes the forgiveness of sins. And that's, of course, true. The life is in the blood, but Cain was a grain farmer. He didn't have blood to offer. But we see the clues in the description of the offerings themselves. Abel brought fat portions. Now, to us, or at least to me, you know, I'm kind of more into low fat. I eat a lot of food, maybe, and some of what I shouldn't, but generally I cut the fat off of a piece of meat. If there's a steak and there's fat on the outside, I'll cut that off. I want the meat. I want the steak, not the fat. But the fat was regarded by the ancients as the best part. And in the scripture, God says, the fat belongs to me. The fat portions are mine. The fat is the good, good part, and that belongs to God. And not only did Abel bring the fat portions, but also from the firstborn. He took the first, the best. And there we see the difference, the big difference. Abel thought enough of God to give the first, the best of what he had. God was his number one priority, not self. And so that difference in those sacrifices is an important question for us to consider in our lives as well. Do we give God our best? Do we give him our first fruits? Do we give him right off the top or if, we just wait and see if we have something left over? Or even do we give him our tithe? And the Bible does teach the tithe, which is 10%. In Malachi chapter 3, the Bible teaches, just like the fat of those animals, the tithe already belongs to God. Malachi 3, verses 7 through 12. It belongs to him. And if we don't return to him the 10%, we're robbing God. And Jesus, in his uh, speech to the scribes and Pharisees, the woes he pronounced on them, one of the things he criticized them for was uh, they gave their tithes, but they didn't love people and show mercy and so forth. And we look at that and say, well, love is more important than tithing. Well, yes, that may be true, but Jesus also said to practice both. Don't give up one for the other. So Jesus upheld the giving of what belongs to him. And moving on, how much time do we give God? Do we give him lip service but not actually any time or any uh, as well as our treasure? Do we hold our possessions dear to ourselves or do we see them as something lent to us from God for our use, for his glory? Do we hold back ourselves from God? Somebody said, you know, if you give your heart to God, the offerings will follow. And that's really true. If we haven't given ourselves completely to God, well, to anyone else, I mean, if you don't give your heart to the person you're married to, you're not going to give them much of anything else. You're not going to clean the house. You're not going to work for them and bring you know, money home. You're not going to do the things that you should do to make that person's life happy. And it's the same with God. But God, the one who made us, also promised life, complete fulfillment, if only we give ourselves to him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
So Cain did not put God first. Cain did not listen also to his conscience, nor to God. In chapter 4, verse 5, uh, Cain was very angry and his face was downcast because God accepted Abel's offering but not his. So what's the obvious thing you could do about that? Improve the offering, right? Change your attitude. But Cain did neither of those things. Rather, he, so to speak, shot the messenger. He killed his brother. Get rid of the evidence. He didn't want to be reminded that God accepted Abel's and not his. But, you know, we don't bring ourselves up by pulling other people down. It doesn't work well that way. But here, once again, the Lord's words to Cain in verse 6. Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. The Lord reminded Cain that he had not done right. That was the source of the problem, not something Abel did or didn't do. It's Cain's heart problem and the actions that followed from that. In Psalm 85, we see that peace is the result of righteousness. If Cain wanted to have peace in his heart, if Cain wanted to have the uh, uh, peace with God, all he had to do is do what was right in God's sight, and it's the same for us. If we want peace, do what is right. But Cain went ahead instead and blamed Abel for his own problem. But Cain was only following his parents' example. Now, the first sin was disobeying God, eating the fruit, the forbidden fruit. What was the second sin? You know, God uh, came down and said, what have you done? And Eve blamed Adam, and Adam blamed, you know, I, you know they all blamed each other. Finally, it got back to the snake, but they were all sort of really blaming God. It's your, your problem. You know, you gave me this woman, and she did the wrong thing, and, and that snake, uh, uh, you know, he screwed it all up for us. It just comes natural. We want to blame someone else. And Cain did that as well. He blamed Abel for his problems. But our righteousness and our, our acceptance before God depends not on someone else, but upon ourselves again. The soul that sins is the one that shall die, the scripture says. But also, he who is righteous shall live. So it's pretty easy to see why the things turn out the way they did in the story of Cain and Abel. And it's pretty easy also to condemn Cain for his evil and his foolish behavior. Many of us, we... You know, it's not too hard to figure out. We get jealous of people sometimes. We get envious too, but, you know, we don't go and murder people for Pete's sake. We're not that dumb. But Jesus would warn us in our complacency or in our self-righteousness not to get too smug about ourselves, I think. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Don't murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says to his brother, Reka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. And here Jesus strikes home in our hearts, I think. Who of us has not been angry with someone else? And some, some translations read, angry without cause, which is probably the best translation. But probably we've all been that way. And we read that verse and, and, you know, we don't tell somebody Reka when we're angry at him. That word means nothing to us. But it's a word of contempt. It's like calling someone an imbecile and, you know, thinking that about that person. And the word uh, you fool in Greek, literally, it's moron. That's the word in the New Testament. You look it up calling people moron, and Jesus says, you're in danger of the fire of hell. Anybody ever guilty of calling people moron? I know I am. 
And such attitudes, though, if we hold on to those things and don't get rid of it right away, can lead to unforgiveness. And then we find ourselves in all kinds of trouble. Jesus taught in the Lord's Prayer in the, a little later on in the sermon. He taught the Lord's Prayer, taught the words, how to pray it, and then he followed that up with, if you forgive men when they forgive you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And that's pretty serious. So if we persist in unforgiveness, then we doom ourselves. We don't have to murder somebody else like Cain did. We can all be right here in hard-headedness and careless speech. That's why any evil thoughts that we have need to be cut off right at the beginning. I have a book of desert monks, people that lived in the desert uh, on their own hermits, and people would go out and flock to the monks and get wisdom from them. And one person was feeling pretty guilty about his evil thoughts, and, and the, uh, the particular monk he was talking to said, well, spread out your cloak and try to catch the wind. And he said, well, Father, that's impossible. You can't catch the wind. And the father monk said, that's true. And in the same way, you can't catch your, you can't control your thoughts, but you can let go of them and get rid of them as soon as they enter your mind. God told Cain, sin is lurking at the door of your hearts. Uh, thoughts are being planted in our minds all the time. Whether it's from our own flesh or from Satan or one of his demons, those things come. It's not a sin to be tempted. Jesus faced temptations, and yet he was without sin. But the problem is, is not dismissing that thought, not moving on beyond it, not sending it back. I found out, and I reminded myself of this, actually, I haven't been doing this, I kind of forgot, but I have found in past history, if I detect a little scratch in my throat, usually the best thing is to eat a slice of raw onion or, or get some horseradish and put that on a cracker. And you're thinking that sounds gross. Well, it is pretty gross. <laughs> but it does, it does fix a cold if you catch it quick enough. Or it has in my, in, uh, for me, it does pretty good. And that's what we need to do with sins. When we, uh, if I don't take that raw onion or, or horseradish, most of the time, it'll go ahead and develop into a regular cold, and I'll be coughing and taking medicine like, uh, like everybody else. But that's the way it is with sin. It's better to deal with it when you first detect it, when it's in your mind and in your heart, when it first gets there. That's the first sign, the first symptom. Get rid of it. Take evasive action, so to speak. Matthew chapter 15, Jesus taught, the things that come out of the mouth comes from the heart, and these make a man unclean. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what make a man unclean. And so it all begins with our heart. And so cut off sin while it's small, when it first starts, when it first presents itself. Mel Gibson, when he was making the movie The Passion of Christ, said that he found refuge in the wounds of Christ. That's why he made that movie. He wanted that story to get out, to know what it was Christ suffered on our behalf so others could also take refuge in those wounds. The Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. And Jesus didn't just suffer those wounds for Cain or for Mel Gibson, but for you and for me as well. He was whipped tortured and crucified for the sins of the world. He gave his body and blood. That's what we take with communion. The crucified Lord in Jesus, the blood he shed on the cross, given for us, for our forgiveness. No, we can't lift ourselves up by bringing others down. But only by trusting in Jesus Christ can we be free. Only by following him Following Jesus Christ, will we enjoy life and have salvation and peace with God? God created you. 
You belong to him. It's impossible to please God without faith. Give yourself to God and give your best to God. Cut off evil early while it is still small. And finally, always run to Christ and not from him. Go to Christ in every need, for Jesus is the one who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Amen. Sing our next hymn, Yield Not to Temptation, number 487.